The Edmund Fitzgerald sank in a storm on Lake Superior on November 10, 1975. But before we get into the details, let's go into when it was built and what happened when it was built. The Edmund Fitzgerald was built for the Ogo Bay Norton Company for $8.4 million. But its construction differed from the traditional procedure. Normally, construction would begin on a vessel by laying down its keel and building in the ship up from there. But the Fitzgerald's hull was built in different sections and then joined together. This was the first time this style of assembly had ever been used. Construction began on the vessel on August 9, 1957. Ten months after that, the vessel was ready for launching, and on June 7, 1958, the Fitzgerald was launched. The launch of the Edmund Fitzgerald aroused a lot of superstition. To start it off, it took three tries for the glass bottle to break on the side of the Fitzgerald for it to be christened. After that was done, the ropes securing the Fitzgerald were let loose, but the Fitzgerald hit the water at an awkward angle and it sent a huge wave crashing to the other side of the slip. Because of this, a 58-year-old man suffered a heart attack and died on the scene. All of these circumstances created a lot of superstition and many believed that this was a sign of bad luck for the vessel. Nevertheless, the Fitzgerald went into service and from there broke many records and became known as the pride of the American flag. No one would have believed someone dumb enough to state that the Fitzgerald would ever sink. Just like the Titanic, everyone thought it was unsinkable, thus earning the nickname Titanic of the Great Lakes. It all started on November 8, 1975. On this very day, a low-pressure system formed in the southwestern portion of the United States. At about the same time, another low-pressure system formed in Alberta, Canada. If these two systems continued on their course, they would eventually collide in the middle of Lake Superior. On November 9, 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald was loading 26,116 tons of taconite pellets at Superior, Wisconsin. It was set to deliver them to Zug Island in Detroit. The Edmund Fitzgerald rarely ever made trips to Superior because it would mostly always go to Silver Bay to load its taconite pellets, then go on to deliver them to Toledo, thus earning the nickname the Toledo Express. Taconite pellets are a very dangerous cargo, and the loading procedures should be taken very seriously. First of all, they weigh a whole lot. They weigh up to 140 pounds, and they also are a very absorbent cargo. So if the cargo hold was ever flooded, the taconite pellets would absorb 8 or 9 pounds of water per cubic foot. At about 2.45 p.m. on Sunday, November 9, 1975, the Fitzgerald set out on its final voyage. Two hours after the Edmund Fitzgerald departed Superior, the Arthur and Manderson left two harbors, also loaded with taconite pellets. The Arthur and Manderson was bound for Gary, Indiana. Although both captains weren't worried about the storm, they knew that if this low-pressure system went right over Lake Superior, they would be facing a nor'easter. Nor'easters are caused when cold air moves over water that is still warm from the summer. And they have been the reason for many vessels sinking on the Great Lakes. In the early hours of November 10th, the northeasterly winds were measured at 52 knots, and 10-foot waves slammed into the side of the hull of the Fitzgerald from various directions. The temperature had dropped to 37 degrees, and visibility was only 2 to 4 miles. The Fitzgerald, at this point, was 20 miles south of the island I Royal. On the same time, the National Weather Service issued a storm warning, and Bernie Cooper, the captain of the Arthur and Manderson, radioed Ernest McSorley, and they decided that they would change direction and take a more northeasterly course which would protect them from the Ontario lee shore. The Great Lakes was no place to expect a sunny day to stay the same way, especially not in November. Great conditions could turn into horrible gales. On the Great Lakes, you had to expect the worst. 
Fitzgerald was built to be flexible, and in some situations, it would bend so much that if you were in the tunnel, you couldn't see the other end of the ship. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, the Fitzgerald reached the eye of the storm and sailed under sunny skies for a few minutes. By mid-afternoon, the Fitzgerald neared Caribou Island, a potential hazard for the vessel. In order to make it to Whitefish Bay, the Fitzgerald had to pass by the Six Fathom Shoal, or also known as the North Bank Shoal, which was north of Caribou Island. This was a very shallow area, which rised from 600 feet to 36 feet. But worse than this, an even shallower area, which was uncharted by the Canadian Hydrographic Service, lay directly in front of the Fitzgerald. After the Fitzgerald sunk, by request of the U.S. Coast Guard, the Canadian Hydrographic Service did another survey of the area and found out that the Six Fathom Shoal actually extended a mile further than they had originally thought. In this area, the depth was about 31 feet only. By early evening on November 9th, conditions were worsening and the sea was growing. When the Fitzgerald reached this area, Captain Bernie Cooper remarked, Look at this, Morgan. He pointed to the radar and said, That's the Fitzgerald. He's in close to that six fathom spot. Morgan Clark then looked at the screen and agreed with him. He sure looks like he's in the shoal area, he said. He sure does, Cooper said. He's too close. He's closer than I'd want this ship to be. So, Captain Bernie Cooper altered his course. A few minutes later, at 3.35 p.m., Captain Ernest McSorley radioed to Captain Bernie Cooper that he had problems. He had a fence rail down, some vents missing, and he had a bad list. Captain Bernie Cooper asked him if he had his pumps going. Captain Ernest McSorley replied, yes, both of them. Captain Ernest McSorley then asked, Will you shadow me down the lake? I'll reduce my speed so that you can overtake me. Captain Cooper agreed and stated that he would do his best. Soon after signing off with the Fitzgerald, Captain Cooper realized that the fence rail had to come down because of an extreme change in tension. This could be caused by the ship hogging or from striking the shoal or from the tremendous bending in the turbulent waters by the shoal. This was the reason for Cooper's theory that the Fitzgerald sank because it hit the shoal. At 4.10 p.m., the Arthur M. Anderson was radioed by the Edmund Fitzgerald, and Captain McSorley said to Morgan Clark that he had lost both radars and asked him if he could assist him and navigation. Clark agreed without any hesitation. A few minutes later, Captain McSoyler radioed the Grand Maria's Coast Guard station and asked if the Whitefish Point radio beacon was working. Gary Wigan, who was standing in for the regular radio men, told him to stand by. He said, we don't have the equipment here to tell if it is operating properly. I will call you back. Eventually, he did and told Captain McSorley that the news was negative. The Whitefish Point Lighthouse had suffered a power outage, therefore the radio beacon was not working. A crew was working to restore its signal, though. At about 6.30 p.m., two gigantic waves slammed into the Anderson. The ship was able to stand up to them, but Captain Bernie Cooper said that if these waves continued down the lake, they would have hit the Fitzgerald at about the time it sank. He says, I don't know, but I've often wondered if those two seas might have been the ones. At 7.10 p.m., Captain McSorley took a call from Morgan Clark on the Arthur M. Anderson. They discussed a ship that could come into a collision with the Fitzgerald and concluded that it would pass west of it. Before signing off, Morgan Clark asked, how the Fitzgerald was making out with its problems. McSorley answered with the last words ever heard from his mouth. We are holding our own. Okay, fine, answered Clark. I will be talking to you later. This was the last time 
anyone heard any words from the Fitzgerald. After that, the Fitzgerald sank. There was no distress calls, no cries for help, nothing. It was silent. It just disappeared. The Fitzgerald had sunk, and the legend was born. After the Anderson reached Safe Harbor in Whitefish Point, the Coast Guard asked him to go back out and look for any survivors. At first, he was reluctant, but eventually he thought that he could help any remaining survivors out there, and he didn't know if someone was in need of help. He was also able to get another freighter to help him on the search for the Fitzgerald. The William Clay Ford would also go out and search for the vessel. Both of them would search and eventually they would find some debris. They ran into lifeboats, life rafts, and life preservers which looked to be unused. The fate of the Fitzgerald was now almost certain. There are three main theories to how the Fitzgerald could have sunk. One is that the shoal ripped a hole in the side of its hull and it was sinking from then on. Another one is that the two rogue waves that slammed into the Anderson around 6.30 p.m. eventually reached the Fitzgerald and caused it to sink. A third one is that the hatch covers were not clamped correctly or were loose and therefore caused water to enter the cargo hold. I personally think that it hit the shoal and the rogue waves just finished it off. So what do you think? Comment in the comment section below. And subscribe to my channel and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.